Eric Momsen. I teach third grade at Maplewood School here in Summersworth. At the request of our Summersworth School Board, it is an honor to join you here this evening at our meet and greet gathering for Superintendent Candidate John Shea. In the proud and storied history of our great town and city of Summersworth, education has always formed a strong foundation upon which our wonderful community is built. Early town records show schoolmaster Jacob Wentworth teaching out of his home in the Rocky Hills of the Great Falls District of Summersworth back in the 1790s. In 1831, a schoolhouse was built the Orange Street School, the first of 21 educational buildings that have dotted the landscape of the hilltop city over the past two centuries, from little one-room schoolhouses to our beautiful schools of the 21st century. In 1848, the New Hampshire legislature passed the Summersworth Act, which allowed for graded public schools here in the Granite State for the first time. Shortly thereafter, New Hampshire's first public high school, Great Falls High School, opened in 1850 upon Prospect Hill here in Summersworth. Nearly 11,000 diplomas have been awarded since that historic day. Summersworth's motto is proud past, bright future. Day by day, the pages turn in our Summersworth history book, and year after year, proud new chapters are written. This year, we turn another page and begin a new chapter as we look to hire our district's 33rd superintendent of schools. Building upon our proud past, we look to our future, our future ever so bright. Only the very best for the wonderful young generations of Summersworth Hilltoppers yet to come. In January, the Summersworth School Board formed the Superintendent Search Steering Committee. This committee was tasked with vetting applicants against the highest professional standards in the following competency domains. Collaborative leader, communicator, innovator, troubleshooter and problem solver, and relationship builder. The board desired candidates who demonstrated the capacity to build trust and credibility, build teams, and exhibit professionalism under all circumstances. The committee, consisting of a wide variety of people involved in all aspects of education, has worked tirelessly and diligently over the past two months to narrow down the field of candidates. This evening, the Superintendent Search Steering Committee is proud to present to the community their recommended candidate for superintendent of schools here in the Hilltop City, Mr. John Shea. During his visit to our different school buildings on February 21st, candidate John Shea overwhelmingly gained the confidence and support of the school staff and students in each building. While answering questions, he was well-spoken and demonstrated a knowledge of current professional practices. His willingness to honestly answer hard questions during these vi visits engendered trust and credibility. In addition to demonstrating effective communication in the moment, candidate Shea outlined how his future leadership would intentionally involve SAU 56 stakeholders in the communication process. Mr. Shea clearly articulated the value that he placed upon Summersworth employees and the role they would play in his collaborative leadership style. These assertions aligned with examples of past leadership experience that Mr. Shea shared with the group during his interview. He quickly demonstrated outstanding relationship building skills. Faculty and staff perceived candidate Shea to be authentically engaged in conversations with employees, remembering their names and answering questions asked. Throughout the day, the adults in each school building genuinely appreciated Mr. Shea's authentic care for students. At Idle Idlehurst Elementary School, for example, he welcomed a hug from a nonverbal student and was observed interacting naturally with this child while still continuing to engage with the adults in the room. 
Employees describe candidate Shea as caring, enthusiastic, honest, and trustworthy. They believed he would be an advocate for both students and employees. One individual wrote that he seemed to really care about Summersworth and building community. He was enthusiastic and energetic and wanting to do his job well. They appreciated his upfront honesty and believed that he would be flexible and creative in his problem solving, but would make decisions when needed. During his interview with the Superintendent Search Steering Committee, it became clear that he has a proven track record of facilitating the problem-solving process effectively for stakeholders and for being innovative in his approach to meeting goals. These skills were particularly evident as candidate Shea shared about his tenure as head of school at the Cambridge Academy Ethiopia, where he served as a transitional leader of a new K-12 international school of over 800 students from 40 different countries, managing 150 staff members. Candidate Shea articulated a vision for building the SAU 5016, including a willingness to participate in the hiring and onboarding process of the newly posted positions of Special Education Director and Assistant Superintendent. Mr. Shea further communicated his desire to establish strong, effective communication with building level leaders. In all of his interactions and communications, candidate John Shea was perceived to exhibit professionalism, showed respect for each individual with whom he interacted, and cast a strong and hopeful vision for the future of Summersworth School District. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you candidate for superintendent of the schools, Mr. John Shea. Thanks, Eric. I feel like uh, I should just let Eric stay up here for the rest of the night. Um, I'll, I'll, I should begin, I think, with just a brief introduction. Um, and I apologize. The talking about myself part is my least favorite part of this process. Um, but for those at home and those of you here that don't, uh, aren't familiar with my background, I'll do that quickly, and then we can jump in to questions and answers. Um, I've been in the education field for close to 30 years now. Um, it wasn't what I did right after uh, college, but I found my way in my late 20s um, to high school, back to high school. I taught at Cambridge Engine Latin in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, English, Social Studies, and Technical Arts. Um, I co-founded a charter school in San Diego called High Tech High that was featured in an education documentary in two 2015 um, called Most Likely to Succeed. I was basically the number two guy there. Um, ended up at the, uh, as the upper school director at Berwick Academy across the river from us for a bit. Then came over and was the principal of Spalding High School in Rochester. I did some work um, helping Kittery redesign their high school after they made a decision not to, um, they, they fought pressure to consolidate and to have their kids go to Marshwood. They wanted to, nothing against Marshwood, they wanted to keep their kids um, in, in uh, Kittery and at Trape and decided if we're gonna keep the school open, let's also get it right. I worked with the superintendent and the school board there to kind of rethink what the school would look like. Uh, Primarily for my kids, um, I took some positions abroad. Uh, so the whole family and I went to the American Embassy School of Delhi, India, where I was the high school principal, and to the International School of Panama in Panama City, Panama, where I was also a high school principal. Um, and then uh, I found myself back here at Summersworth High School not too long ago. Unfortunately, due to health matters, I needed to step out of that position. Um, I did not foresee being fortunate enough that the opportunity to return to Summersworth might arise. Um, and as Eric alluded to, I, was, uh, I served in an interim capacity to help get a school started in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, a K-12 school. I served as head of school and also as the primary head. Um, we were a bit stretched there. It was the first time I've gotten to work in that capacity um, with uh, that age group, and that was really phenomenal. Um, I have, uh, I loved working in Summersworth when I was here. I was just talking to the board about this, um, and uh, they said, you know, they asked me to explain the attraction. I said, well, I'm from Philadelphia, and I think if you know Philadelphia and you know Summersworth, maybe there's something, I love Philly, and there's probably a connection there, bigger city, but 
uh, a diverse, resilient, gritty, tough, loving, caring community that is not perfect but striving to be better. Um, and, and I have a lot of respect and admiration for the, the hope and, uh, that I've, I've felt from students um, and, and from uh, educators, both when I worked here and on my visit. Uh, my visit a couple weeks ago really kind of cemented it. Um, I, I kind of came into this thinking, okay, well, um, I'm kind of a building principal kind of guy, and uh, I'm not sure about this central office superintendency work. And, uh, and I got so excited after revisiting and, and seeing folks I, I knew from five years ago and kind of get a better handle on things and some good former colleagues and friends who are superintendents also um, encouraged me to look hard at this and I found myself really excited about the opportunity. Um, I, I feel excited about this community. I, I love being a part of schools. That would be the hardest part about serving in a central office, but I think that's a healthy and a good thing. Um, and, uh, and I'll just say lastly that um, I, I'm excited because the school board knows and I, and I hope folks um, and Summersworth or even before know that I, I, I come at this as someone who um, recognizes the fundamental truth that our, that our, our schools were designed um, 100 plus years ago when we knew very little about teaching and learning. It was really just a, it was a model designed around efficiency and economies of scale. And we've kind of done our best in that system all over the United States. Now, this isn't a Summersworth issue. And uh, so I come at this not only caring deeply about the students in Summersworth and in Rollinsford and about, you know, the day-to-day -day piece of this, but the bigger picture is I don't see why Summersworth can't be a town and a school district that shows a lot of the nation, you know, what schools should look like and what schools should be. Um, that, that greater mission, I think, is a valuable one, but it's only served by serving the district and the kids that are here today. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. You visited our school buildings a couple of weeks ago, and you met a number of our wonderful summers who were students along the way. Talk about them for a minute. Yeah, I see there's a front row uh, here today as well. Um, there, there was a really big group in the high school, which was, which was awesome. I think it was probably about 15 or 20 students. Um, they asked you some tough questions, didn't they? they were, <laughs> yes, and, uh, and I appreciated that the, uh, Chris and, and Mike and the, whoever put the group together, it wasn't sort of like, hey, let's just get the student council or let's just get the varsity captains together. It was just, hey, let's just get some students together across grade levels and all across the board. And what was evident is they're, they're thoughtful and they care about their school. Um, a, a large number of them, I know, have younger siblings. So even if they're a junior or a senior, they're thinking, you know, well, I, I want this, this school system and, and this middle school and this high school to be everything it can be for my family. Uh, and I love all the, the, the students I met, an eighth grader at the middle school who's one of nine. Um, everybody probably knows who that is. And <laughs> a couple of kids, a couple of siblings behind her and uh, several in front. Uh, one of who was here in, when I was at the high school. Um, there was just a lot of uh, optimism, um, no nonsense. The middle schoolers that showed me around kind of started out a little bit like we've rehearsed this and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and please don't ask any questions because it'll get us off track. But once they kind of got that through, they were just really sincere and open and proud of their school and of their community. It was, it was really neat to see. I didn't get to talk to the, you know, large groups of elementary school students, other just seen them out and about doing their thing and uh, connecting with a few of them individually. But the energy and the spirit were pretty obvious. Uh, uh, Rollinsford Grade School, unfortunately, was on break. Um, met with some great folks down there, but Maplewood and Idlehurst, the energy was just really exciting, just really positive. You feel those things in a school. I think we all know that. Yep. Talk about some qualities that you see yourself having that you feel would help you in your role as superintendent. Um, I have not uh, served in a central office capaci capacity, but I've worked in uh, both here in Summersworth for a year and in Rochester very closely with superintendent, and assistant superintendent, and school board. Um, so I have a pretty good feel for everything that's involved in the position. Um, I've been told by one former superintendent that coming into it with fresh eyes is probably a really healthy thing. Um, but people that know me um, and know this position have said, you know, skill set wise, um, that it, I'm, I'm in good shape. And that listening, getting the management piece right, getting the leadership piece right, getting the details right, getting the vision right, 
knowing that as a superintendent, um, I think of it as a stewardship kind of position. Um, it's not a CEO, it's not a owner. It's, these, are, these, these, these schools belong to Summersworth and the school board has a sacred responsibility of overseeing the, the schools of Summersworth and Rollinsford and the superintendent has a sacred responsibility to serve in that capacity to serve the community. Um, so I, I think, and I'm a numbers guy and I'm a details guy and I know a lot of that and the Title I and the IDEA stuff and some of the battles that need to be fought and conquered. And it's not about Democrat, Republican, red or blue in my opinion, it's about what makes sense for our kids and our kids' education and funding our kids' education and, and providing them a safe place. Um, those battles I welcome and, and I get kind of excited about, to be honest. Um, talk about your leadership style. What kind of a leader are you? <laughs> Just talk about yourself kind of stuff. The, uh, um, and I, I do appreciate, uh, it, I, I, I'm, I, I love that we have folks that are tuned in from home. I appreciate folks that are tuned in from home and other places. It'd be nice just to kind of sit with you guys, given the size of the group. I'm not a stand at a podium, front of the room kind of leader. Um, I like to sit and talk with people. And we, this group's probably just the right size that we could probably pull that off. Um, but I also want to make sure everybody at home hears this. Um, I think it, it matters more what people I've worked with have to say. But I, I think they tell you that I'm kind of an open door guy. I'm a, make time for people, um, that I have strong convictions about um, what makes education good, but I listen um, and, and collaborate well. Um, and I work really hard. And I've never had my integrity or honesty called into question. Um, that, that one, that's one thing that's pretty easy to get right. <laughs> you know, we all make mistakes and uh, sometimes we forget to do this, forget to do that, but being honest and straightforward is a pretty simple task um, and, and I think an important one. Um, a question that someone asked, how will you work with staff so that they feel empowered to be leaders in our district? Um, well, I'll start by sitting with the building level administrators, the principals and assistant principals, and asking them what they want and what they need from the central office, um, what's going best in their schools, um, what needs work, and of the things that need work, you know, con convince me that uh, I should also understand that, you know, this is how that problem needs to be fixed, get me on the same page, um, I'll ask difficult questions, we'll kind of come to agreements together, and then, and then work, you know, I think the central office needs to be a place where building administrators look to for support rather than, you know, vice versa. Um, and uh, I think that's important. Let's take a walk through the, through the footsteps of a child coming through our school system. They come in as kindergartners, in some case uh, preschool. Uh, talk about early childhood education. The, uh, I'll back up a step further, if that's all right, and just... Uh, as a superintendent, if I'm your next superintendent, um, the responsibility for educating the kids of Summersworth is, doesn't begin and end at the beginning and end of the school day and just during the school year. It's a collaborative mission in the community, parents, social service agencies, broad earth, everything that we can do. So what happens before pre-K, what happens before kindergarten, um, and working with families and parents in the community to make sure kids are coming to school ready to learn in, in every way, shape, and form, making sure kids have opportunities for enrichment over the summer. The pandemic obviously hit um, families and students with lesser resources. You know, the, the, the greater the resources the family had, the more the students were able to do enrichment outside of school, and that was already the case, and the pandemic just made that a little bit worse. So thinking holistically about all those things matters. But uh, a pre-K program um, that is welcoming and that is, is, is supported and encouraging and well-staffed and well-resourced um, is a beginning point, but not, you know, it's bigger than that. A child moves along to elementary school, Idlehurst Elementary School, Maplewood Elementary School. Obviously, reading is real and important. Uh, some questions about, uh, questions about reading instruction. Talk a lot about research base. Um, I've been in education a long time, as, you, as well as you have. Research always seems to be changing from decade to decade, and the pen, pendulum swings back and forth. How can we ensure that the young people of Summersworth, especially those in, K, in grades K through 5, learn to read? The, uh, obviously, the... We got some things wrong in reading, at least some evidence and some research, and I don't mean we, Summersworth, but I mean we, the nation, just with uh, evidence that some of this whole language research and evidence was a program that basically years ago 
made sense for kids that were struggling and had disabilities, and then it was so successful in that niche that everybody kind of took it and, and, and made it a lot bigger than that. Um, and, and now there's you know a lot of regret that maybe this wasn't the right way to go, um, and that phonics and basics are absolutely critical to reading. I would suggest that and one of the things I would love to do early on is sit with building principals and, and involve the school board and agree on some core educational practices and values about what good teaching and learning look like um, and, and line it up with the evidence and line it up with the research so that it's not this every three years, every five years, every 10 years swing of, well, this is what the state's pushing, this is what the federal government's pushing, this is what a private company, um, a technology company is pushing, but s stay true to that. Revisit it from time to time, but not week to week. You know, every several years there might be some adjustments in it. And there's probably eight to ten key convictions there and, and at the elementary level about how students best learn reading and mathematics without any of the jargon or program language built in, but just what the core principles are, um, I think will help guide us so that as we kind of consider what the state might be advocating for or considering other things, we stay true to what we know makes the most sense. I will say that one of the most sacred responsibilities, in my opinion, of elementary schools, uh, students getting up into middle school, reading skills, math skills, a given, but that they maintain their sense of curiosity um, and their sense of responsibility and their discipline work ethic. When they, so if they come to middle school and high school, with those values and those ethics built in, um, and, they, and they still are curious, and they still are passionate about school the way they were in pre-K and kindergarten, that'll go a long way to making middle school and high school everything middle school and high school should be. The perceived notion that, that basically your, your level of cur innate curiosity when you start school and the, the level of curiosity you still have by the time you finish high school just kind of goes like this, um, and uh, there's, multiple reasons for that, but um, that's one of the things we got to get right. Kids in the, our high school students should work their tails off, but they should feel good about it. The way you feel good about working your tail off in baseball practice or football practice is the way you should feel at school as well, regularly. Um, engaged, relevant, this matters. It's not just about getting it done and getting the grade, but kind of a next step up and just that not losing that innate curiosity, which can sometimes be difficult when you're doing too much and you get a little bit more focused on grades and college admissions. Did I answer the initial question? Absol absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. T talk a little bit about math at the elementary level. I, I, I think uh, just in social media and things, it seems like common core math gets a bad reputation and, 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 and people criticize it, but, but there's a lot of good things in our math instruction. Yep. Talk a little bit about math instruction at um, the elementary. Standards that teachers and building administrators are comfortable with um, are absolutely critical. And any good teaching and learning begins with learning goals and learning outcomes. We kind of forget that. We often stumble into curriculum, and then we figure out how to assess it, and we figure out how to grade it, and then we kind of pile it together, and we call it a diploma, or we call it a school year. But to making sure we have good clarity around exactly what our learning goals are, and typically, in my opinion, there's too many of them, particularly as you advance on into high school. Uh, so you, greater depth, greater focus, and what those, whether it's common, I don't have a problem with the Common Core math standards. Um, instructional practice that delivers us to them is kind of the key. And this debate back and forth between rote memory, studying your times table kind of thing, and fill out worksheets endlessly until you've got it, and then you swing too far the other way, where every, everything becomes constructivist in a way that can be really hard for a fourth grade classroom with 23 kids in it um, to kind of, it's kind of stuff sometimes works really well one on one, um, but doesn't always work in a setting. There's usually somewhere in between. You know, at a young age, students need to understand the basics, but they also need to understand constructively and more dynamically, like why this matters. Um, I was there as a parent where the, my students weren't allowed to learn, they weren't allowed to remember that five times seven equals 35 and six times seven equals 42 and seven times seven equals 49. And I was like, but it's kind of handy to know that. <laughs> and but you can kind of do both. Um, and uh, yeah, but anyway, it's, oftentimes um, the answer is somewhere in between when you have a lot of folks staking out ground in either dimension. And, and instructional practice that is varied is critical because kids learn in different ways. Um, there are instructional practices that are bad, and there's some that are better, but it shouldn't be one. There's typically three, four, five, six different instructional practices that make a classroom most effective. A child moves on to the middle school. 
middle schoolers, the ones who wear shorts to school in the middle of January. <laughs> Talk about middle school education. Um, I've, I've always, I have a special place in my heart for middle school educators because that is the place uh, but, you know, high school students, I can I can relate to and I can connect to um, intellectually and the maturity. They're getting to a place where they're kind of it's, it's very exciting. And primary school kids are adorable. Um, and middle school is a middle school is a tough uh, is a tough stretch. But I think the social supposed social emotional learning uh, curriculum um, is important across the board. But maybe in middle school, that's probably one of the places that's most important. Um, if middle schoolers can get through middle school um, and get to high school, um, advancing in reading and mathematics and, and, and having those basic skill sets and, and beyond reading and mathematics and writing the analytics, the thinking piece, because now you're really kind of getting to a place about, you know, how do I know what is true? How do I know make sense of things? How do I ask good questions? Those things, they go throughout elementary, but middle school is where the maturity to kind of be thinking harder critical thinking skills, analytic skills start to um, become very, very important um, and just keep them on track, I guess. But uh, I'm not a middle school expert, um, but I do appreciate that, that those pieces are pretty huge. The skill set's fundamental. Reading, writing, mathematics, I'd say critical thinking and habits of learning are essential and should come before breadth of content. Most content you learn in middle school and even high school is gone within a few years. Um, it doesn't mean you don't cover it, but if you get the skill sets right and you start to you know, tighten up a little bit, I think we'll be better off and teach young people how to learn more than just kind of feel like we're going to give them everything they need to know. A child moves on to high school. High school is the age where they start thinking uh, more seriously about their future. Uh, let's start with how do we best prepare those students who want to attend college? How do we best prepare them in high school? Um, in an ideal, I've always viewed high school as preparing young people for life. Um, and that, that part of that is um, civic responsibility, um, it, which shouldn't be a class. It's really an, a core strand that every student that graduates from high school from Summersworth is prepared to engage and motivated to engage in public life. Um, and our democracy demands that and fulfillment, in my opinion, longer term. Engagement in your community and engagement in our country demand that. And the other side of it is preparing and starting to think about what you want to do for work, um, which again has two purposes, because to find me a meaningful and fulfilling way to make a living is huge, but our economy also demands that. It kind of, it, it's just kind of the, the nature, and that those strands should really run throughout high school. And if you get those things right, um, and you, know, you do some tweaking and adjusting here and there as necessary, applying to competitive four-year colleges is going to be an easy transition from that. The fixation on what do you need to do to, to, to get into college, and oftentimes we think about getting into college rather than be prepared to succeed in college, but those things line up, in my opinion, and I think I've seen this happen and there's good evidence to support it, with preparing young people for meaningful and fulfilling work and meaningful and fulfilling participation in civic life. I think the tricky part about high school is that the pre-K through eighth grade um, year at a time um, approach makes good sense. Um, high school gets a little bit different because you have, um, you, you now have a lot more ninth graders studying with 10th graders, 10th studying with 11, sometimes 10th, 11th, 12th, and it's a little bit easier to let go of you're a ninth grader, you're a 10th grader, you're an 11th grader, you're a 12th grader. The idea that every young person that shows up at Summersworth High School is going to learn what they need to learn in exactly four years, despite that their interests and their plans are going to be significantly different, and despite the fact that they all showed up in very different places, is a really odd way to structure high school. Um, and the reality is you're going to start having folks like, I'm, I'm going, to, I, I'd like uh, military service is a terrible thing as a last resort. You know, I had nothing else to do. Military service, because it's what I want to do, and I care about this country, and it's, it's my responsibility, it's my, is a beautiful thing. So a student going off, that, that that's their intention. A student going to a two-year school. A student is going to work and then figure out what they're going to do next. A student wants to go to junior college, a four-year college. The paths are very different, and their long-term plans are very different. And this is where I think we could do a better job of creating a little bit more flexibility 
for students to graduate on the path that they want to graduate on um, without it looking too disruptive. Um, I've had this, these conversations before in other places, and often things come up like, well, who will go to the junior prom? If we've got, well, why don't we, you know, <laughs> Summersworth High School is a small school. Maybe anybody go to the prom. <laughs> you know, we'll figure that out. Um, but the, there's some things that merit maybe um, rethinking. Tucked away in the back of our high school is our Career Technical Center, a wonderful gem. Talk a little bit about Career Technical Education. It's at the front if you come from the other uh, down Cemetery Road. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, you know, 25 years ago, um, what was then vocational education was unfortunately the sad, you know, you come out of eighth grade and if you have good scores and or your parents went to college, you went this way. And if your academic performance and or your parents didn't go to college, you went this way. And it was just a, it was a horrible system. And we've kind of, the great thing about what happened with vocational, and I, this is how I entered uh, my educational career at Cambridge Ridge and Latin. I came in through the vocational program, which then became a career and technical education center. Um, the pedagogical approaches within most career technical educational programs 20, 25 years ago were sort of the cutting edge. You learn by doing. You do the things are you, you do things with depth. You have real authentic projects. Um, and it was the English department chair at Cambridge Ridge and Latin that said, whoa, this is what we should be doing across the entire high school. And it began to think pedagogically about what, you know, it was the vocational integration with academics federal grant that kind of um, brought some of that stuff to Cambridge Ridge and Latin at the time. Um, it, I love that Caitlin and the, 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 our program is terrific, but I, 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 li I like to think of it as one big school, even though in many ways it's two different schools and uh, with different administrators. But the students, I think, are, I hope that's invisible to students. Like you take classes here, you take classes there. Um, whether you're going to four-year college um, or whether or not you want to do an apprenticeship when you graduate, that folks take advantage of those options, um, I think is terrific. And I, I, I've seen parents kind of who were so fixated on their kids uh, going to four-year college um, see, and, some, and a lot of students that do the CTE programs do go on to four-year colleges, but some of them get offered jobs making $75,000 a year right out of high school, <laughs> and then their parents aren't so wigged out anymore that they're not going to college first. Um, so those pathways, there's so many, the, the, the conventional idea that there's just two or three different ways to come out of high school, we have to blow that up all together. There's so many different ways, and the CTE programs are just phenomenal, and that we can take advantage of the Tri-City Agreement, so if we don't have it here, we can, transportation gets a little bit tricky, but th that's a good way to pool resources. Um, Abs absolutely. Well. Talk to the parent of the child who is on an IEP, an individualized education plan. How are you gonna ensure that their needs are met? Um, well, there's no easy way to answer that for a hypothetical single student, and we talked about it in the central office um, a week or two ago when I was here as well. Um, the, one of the things that makes the American education system so um, inspiring is our noble goal to educate all of our kids, um, regardless of where they come from, regardless of socioeconomic standing, regardless of whether they're an immigrant, regardless of whether they have a learning disability of some sort or another, or a physical handicap of some sort or another. So that, I think, is one of the more wonderful things um, that we've gotten right in our school system and, and one of the beautiful things. So any individual, as a building principal, I've, at Summersworth, I was regularly involved in all the IEP meetings. Um, and uh, not as much when I was in Rochester, because we had some a staff person who was doing it, but I, I was always one that sat with special education staff, and it was always, what do you need, what's going well, and, and how can I be supportive? And I've always been really engaged in those classrooms as well, um, but at Summersworth High School being no different. Um, Talk about school sports and extracurricular activities. Um, School sports done right is one of my favorite things on the planet. Um, not all school systems get schools, you know, the school sports done right. Um, and to me, done right means competitive, high quality, but everybody participates in some form or another. When you start bumping kids off of the JV team because they're not going to have a spot on the varsity squad, sure, field of varsity squad set on winning, and we've done a lot of that here lately. But when you start thinking in those terms, or when a coach says, I got a freshman that's extraordinary and a senior that's extraordinary, and they're parallel, and you say, well, I'm playing the freshman. 
because that's going to buy me three. You know, that's what that's a, that's what a college Division One coach does. But when you say no, I'm playing the senior because this is about the kids first. Let's win and let's be competitive, but let's make it about the kids. The teamwork aspect of it, the discipline aspect of it. Sometimes, sadly, it's what kids it keeps kids' grades up because they know if they <laughs> they drop a little, you know, they, their kid their grades should be up for other reasons. But uh, no, I, I love it, and I think it's a great community building force. Um, and uh, we always need to make sure that academics are first and foremost. And especially as kids are looking at what they're going to do after high school, I've seen uh, young people sort of realize a year or two after they left that maybe I should have let go of the sports at that point because I could have gone to a school that would have been a better fit for what I do longer term. Um, so that's always a delicate balance. Um, but the sports piece, I think, is terrific. Extracurriculars as well. In a small school, you can only do so much, but I think the spirit, you know, we have small schools across the board. Um, and that came up at with the middle schoolers brought that up about, you know, more extracurriculars and, uh, and the idea, well, we talked about it together. And so well, you, you might only have two or three kids, but how can we figure that out? Um, there is, and there is good evidence that students are engaged in sports and extracurriculars all, all do better academically. And you know, it's hard to know which connects with what order those things happen in, but they're pretty important. Changing gears, talk about discipline in the schools. I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, I, as a, a high school building administrator, whatever you call it. I love discipline because to me it's a form of teaching. It's working with young people um, and, and helping them grow. Um, and, and that's a big part of, you know, it's not all just about academics and everything else, but it's about who you are as a human being. And, and, and owning that and sharing that and creating high expectations together, you know, the best way to create an environment where students are supportive of one another or caring of one another um, and look out for one another and are respectful of one another is to help, is to remind students to cultivate it. And, uh, and it, it, coming from varsity sports captains, coming from student council, coming from all kinds of students that kind of take it upon themselves um, to kind of step up um, is, is a huge part. And the faculty need to role model all those things as well. Um, and any time a student's kind of disruptive or off course and uh, those one-on-one -on -one conversations about, okay, what are you doing and why are we doing it and, and having them understand it and grow from it is the goal. Um, Absolutely. How do we attract and retain great teachers? Um, I think we're already doing a, a fair bit of that, um, which is a good thing. Um, and, and I'd like to see us do more of it. Um, I think salaries, benefits, and everything, com being roughly competitive with surrounding districts is always gonna be a huge piece of it. Um, and if we're not gonna get out in front, um, let's make it a, a, a school district and a set of schools that people desperately wanna work at because of the culture, because of the sense of professional development, the sense of mission, the sense of community. I think there, we're, we're, uh, we're getting there, um, if not already there in, in many places. Um, and I know, Working at Summersworth High School uh, five years ago, there were faculty that are, you know, that could have gone other places, and made a little more money, that are attached either because this is home or it's become home, or they just kind of adore this community or this school. But we also lose teachers who can get five, six, seven, ten thousand dollars more without moving in another district. So let's at least get in, get in the same ballpark on those things. But probably the, the critical answer is really going to be um, just making the culture of the schools um, continuing to move forward so that putting salary benefits aside, if somebody just comes into this area, just imagine from out of outside the area and they just word of mouth, where would I want to work as an educator or where would I want to live as a parent with young kids? Summersworth should be at the top of the list. There's no reason it shouldn't be. Not third, not fourth, but just the, the unique things, and there's a good place to work, good place to send your kids. Keep building on that. We have a sign out in front of the uh, SAU office, and for a long time it said, hiring paraprofessionals. It seems like um, many uh, districts in our state are struggling with hiring and, and retaining paraprofessionals, these really key roles that, 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 that do tremendous work within our school buildings. How do we attract and retain great paraprofessionals? Yeah, I, I think my answer would be the, the same to the, the last question, that it's got to be a place that people are excited to work in where paraprofessionals are simply part of the team. They're not in a separate group. They're part of the team, faculty, staff, all together. Um, 
and the culture is such, you know, with the same problem with transportation, bus drivers, substitutes, teachers in certain areas. Um, there's no easy answers to that because there's just there's shortages across the board. There's sh shortages on the administrative side as well. Um, so money's not limitless. We do our best on salary and benefits, but we make this a really inspiring place to come to come work. Um, and we make do. You can't have 18 paraprofessionals do the work of 27 and expect that you aren't going to fry them and send them off somewhere else. If you've got 18 paraprofessionals, then you've got to rethink the workload so that your kids are served and paraprofessionals have a healthy life. Do you see Summersworth as a diverse community? Talk a little bit about that. That's one of the things I like about Summersworth. I mean, we are in New Hampshire. We are in this part. You know, the diversity means different things, but... Uh, Socioeconomically, um, the Indonesian community here. The, the, I was always struck from the beginning that Summersworth is a pretty special place. Um, and the, the, there's, is, in terms of just the surrounding area, there's a good sense of diversity here that I'm pretty excited about. Um, we are, compared to Boston or even Portland or other places, Manchester, we're not that kind of diversity. But for this region in New England and in the Seacoast area, um, I think folks that don't know Summersworth don't have a full feel for just like, eh, it's a pretty accepting, interesting community with a lot of good stuff happening. Um, not perfect, but uh, I think that's, that's pretty exciting. That's great. You've worked in schools around the world. What is something that American schools get right and do well, and what's something that we struggle with? Um, I, I might have answered this a couple of questions ago inadvertently. I think the... Um, where this system began was the, the kind of this really noble uh, mission, Jeffersonian mission to educate everybody. Um, and you find that's different than other places where you've talked? Yes, there's uh, not everywhere, but there's uh, to embrace, um, you know, 93, 94, 95 percent of American school students are in public schools. There's a lot of talk about private schools and Catholic schools and independent schools, particularly in New England. But well over 90% of our students are in public schools, and that includes, uh, and, and that includes immigrant populations. The, the, the focus on uh, additional languages, in addition to language, you know, bringing students up to speed on English. The focus on students with uh, disabilities. Um, it's a pretty powerful thing that I think we take for granted in this country um, that not everybody tackles. Um, one of the things that's very different. Folks outside of the United States will tell you, well, what is an American school? Because we're the most decentralized system in the developed world. Um, there really is not a central, you know, and we cherish that for the most part. It's a very New Hampshire thing, but uh, it, uh, it, it in common throughout. But other than having a basic framework that allows you to move from third grade in one part of the country to fourth grade in another part of the country and roughly be in order, um, Compared to the British, compared to large parts of Europe, the large parts of Africa, large parts of Asia, uh, the curriculum is set at the country level, um, not at the local level. Um, and I've been asked numerous times whether I think we should be more centralized, and um, my answer has always been, well, if, if, you, if I got to pick who the person in charge was, then the centralized approach would make really good sense, and I think almost all of us feel that way. Um, but, uh, or, or decentralized, same thing, but it creates a lot of debate and it, it creates a little bit of back and forth um, in terms of what we talked about 15 minutes ago about now this is how we're going to teach reading, now this is how we're going to teach reading, now this, you know, that kind of thing. But. Talk about the future of education. Where are we going to be 20 years, 50 years, 100 years from now? Um, there was a tremendous amount of energy um, that began in the 80s around um, our public education system that just, you know, this is where the charter school movement, whether you like it or don't like it, separate point, but um, a lot of things came about in the 80s, uh, into the 90s, uh, into the early part of this uh, millennium, this century, sorry, um, 25, 30 years um, around this fundamental issue of the design of our schools, um, and it, it got a little off track with the Great Recession 13, 14 years ago. Um, we came out of that, and we went into the pandemic, and we the country got uh, very divided politically in that era, and um, a lot of the energy in that 25-ish year period around what should a school look like, um, what's the best curriculum, how might we design this, a lot of grants and money went into it. Um, kind of petered out. 
and the conversations turned to bathrooms and um, sports and books and libraries and mask and no mask and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that forget the rest of the country summer's worth <laughs> moving forward um, gets past that um, or to whatever degree that that whole national environment is happening um, we move past that regardless of who the US uh, government secretary of education is a, a year or two from now, regardless of who the Department of Ed um, chair of education is, that we kind of settle in on what our core values are and have some good discussions about what this ought to look like um, and move forward with it aggressively. Um, because I'm not sure, the, sh the short answer, the shorter answer to your question is, I'm not sure education nationally is going to look a whole lot different 25 years from now than it looks now, or that it looked 25 years ago, or that it looked 125 years ago, because we haven't really shown that we've got the capacity or the conviction to, to sort this out and, and, uh, and move forward together on it. So let's do it in Summersworth. <laughs> Um, because, you know, this is the right size community. Let's uh, incrementally, step by step, agree upon what things ought to look like. And maybe 25 years from now, um, we'll be one of the districts everybody looks at and says, okay, th wait a minute, this is what, you know, look, look, this is what education should look like. Standardized testing. <laughs> that question? Whatever you want to take. The, uh, I need to learn more about the testing uh, system that's in place now in New Hampshire. Um, you know, the, for folks, whether at home or here, we kind of, we've been through a variety of this is the test you will use, either dictated by the state or by the federal government, to now a system of, well, you pick the test you want to use and kind of use it how you'd like. Um, I do not object. Uh, a, there are good standardized tests that can be helpful. Um, NWEA. Um, and measure progress that kind of the, a, a fair bit of experience there and this is a district self-imposed test not from the state or the federal government to label this that or the other thing but that provides teachers with data and the school system with data that really help you look at you know where students are moving across some key parameters that can be really helpful teaching to it uh, or high school students that obsess about SATs, for example, we're, al we're almost getting past that. Um, the number of schools that are going SAT optional and it really doesn't, you know, there's that like, oh, but if I don't submit an SAT, they're going to assume I'm just not that smart or I didn't do that well. No. The, the, all the data is out there. Uh, of schools are looking at it. So we're kind of moving past that in a pretty healthy way. Um, but done, done in small doses in ways that are helpful to get information and data in the hands of educators in ways you can't really do with non-standardized tests, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of. We just can't be, you know, the, the adage about it doesn't matter how many times you weigh the pig, it's not going to get any fatter. You just can't test, 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 and think that that's education. It's just a small piece. School funding, taxes, a tax cap. I'm not a um, resident of Summersworth. Um, I, I would see my mission as your superintendent to work with my building administrators and the school board um, to say this is what we believe we need next year um, to properly do what we want to do and to advocate for that and to fight for it um, vehemently. But I'm okay with the city manager and the, the, uh, the city council and community members. That's, that, that decision belongs to you. And at the end of the day, you know, how we work within a tax cap and how we work within funding, I see my mission is to say this is what we could have done or should have done, and this is what we will do, and we'll always make the best of it. But I will advocate wholeheartedly. I do believe you know we're around $33 million, and we're over $20,000 a student on average, that I think we're in the right ballpark of spending. I'm not a superintendent that would come in thinking we got to move this thing light years ahead. And the confusion about all the ARPA money, the um, COVID relief money that came in and now is disappearing, and what inflation has done over the last few years, and what faculty shortages and staff shortages have done, whether it's paraprofessionals or bus or gases, there are a lot of pressures that have made school budgets really tricky over the last several years. And hopefully some of that will settle out. Um, 
But uh, I don't consider it my responsibility to decide whether or not we have a tax cap and what it is. I, consider, I would consider it my responsibility to tell you this is how much money I believe we need. And Katie pointed it out really well in one of our discussions. And you can't be doing it a year at a time. You got to be thinking three to five years out. What's the strategic plan? You're going to get thrown a lot of wrenches in the process. Um, but uh, that's the only way to kind of go at it and, and have a school board understand that and do our best to communicate it to the city council and to the community. How do you foresee your relationship with our school board? Um, the, you know, my responsibility working with the school board, and I've worked with school boards in a lot of different capacities, but not this one, um, is to, when we talked a little bit about this before the meeting, um, to make sure you know everything you need to know in order to do your job, um, to answer all your questions um, from me as we move forward, um, and provide you kind of with uh, the information and the insight to kind of govern properly, um, but to also, the same way I would do with building administrators, to also push and provocatively ask questions about, but shouldn't we be, or couldn't, could we think about this differently, to engage in some of those conversations. I know the school board commitment is a huge one. We talked about that earlier, and it's a lot of hours. And, and from my experience, I know that a lot of those hours are just rough, you know? It's like policy X3297413, move this comma, change this, goes through, you know, and it's just like, it has to be done, but it's not the rewarding part of your job, um, other than the fact that it has to be done. I think the most exciting parts are like th those strategic conversations about, where do we want to be in five years and how do we get there? And what does that look like and, and how do we fund it? I am a big fan of bringing in outside funding. Um, it's hard to, there's ways to do that sometimes that can be operational and be part of your budget ongoing for longer terms and get bigger commitments, but also as you do stuff that moves a school forward to get some of that grant money that, you know, in the 90s and the 2000s was a lot more prevalent. Um, Maybe in some ways, as a lot of that energy has died down, um, summers might, summers worth might be better poised to get some of that because a lot of uh, school systems and schools have kind of let go, and they're fighting about other things that are, in my opinion, deck chairs on the Titanic kind of conversations, rather than how do we fix this ship and what should this ship look like? Um, Caitlin, technology. <laughs> You have that. You have the look of the. Doesn't this start at seven, Caitlin? <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Technology in education. Talk about technology's role in education. Um, technology can be complicated and expensive, so it's always a careful, delicate conversation. Um, there, as 15, 20, 25 years ago, like all the tech guys and women, although they all seem to be guys 20, 25 years ago, um, you know, hey, look at this, hey, look at that, let's do this, let's do that, there, and Microsoft was pushing stuff at us, and Google was pushing stuff at us, and Apple was pushing stuff at us. I, I'm, I believe we need to look very carefully, because most of the technology that we introduce students to will be obsolete by the time they're actually in the workforce, but that they get used to and comfortable with learning it and adapting to it. Um, but show me how it, how it improves learning. Um, and show me the evidence for how it improves learning, then tell me how much it's going to cost, and then tell me how much it's going to cost next year and the year after and the year after. Are we maintaining it? Are we replacing it? So we really look hard at those kinds of things because you still do a lot without, you know, well, technology is a funny word. Every, the pen and pencil and the radio and television were cutting-edge technology. It, so it's the, it's the pace that's really picked up. But uh, students need to grow up in it, to be familiar with it, to be prepared for the world they're going to live in but they don't need to grow up with their face buried in a screen and miss out on a lot of the critical social and stuff that's around them. And, and we need to think carefully about costs, both upfront costs and, and long-term costs. Drugs and alcohol, vaping, we hear a lot about that. We, we, we are all too familiar with, with some of the evils of society. How, how, how do we make sure that our students don't fall into those traps? I think there's already some uh, like wraparound holistic services, and I'd love to have some conversation with the board. Um, I don't see those as problems for agencies outside of the schools. I see them as something that we all tackle together. Um, I, as a high school teacher and as a high school principal, I was always pretty relentless about reminding students about what drug and alcohol can do to you, and as, as, especially as young people start driving. 
you know, one of the most selfish things a human being can ever do is get in a car and drive it when they're not sober. You know, and just the way, you know, those kinds of things, and just kind of, and, and, and spending time on those things, but just really understanding the impact that it has. And oftentimes, young people are seeing that happen in their families and in the world around them, um, up close and personal. Um, but I think we need to work with uh, the broader community. That's, that's, you can't get a good education if you're fundamentally not healthy enough uh, to be showing up every day um, and prepared to learn. And I know that, that's an issue everywhere. Um, and it, we got to tackle it head on. Well, you're having fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking too much and not, uh, the, the only part of this is that it's, uh, and I guess that's the format, and I appreciate, Eric, all you're doing on this, but I wish this was more conversational. I'm, I'm sticking around whenever this is over, so anybody wants to talk, I'm in no hurry to go anywhere when it's finished. Um, so I appreciate the, the wonderful job you've done uh, moderating, Eric. I, I've got a few minutes left. Yeah. Uh, uh, I know, I knew you did. <laughs> I've got a few minutes left, and I, I will uh, turn those few minutes over to you to say any closing remarks that you would like to say. The, uh, well, I, I will also, if there's anything, you know, that folks want to ask as well, um, no, the, the, the visit um, a week or two ago, I've lost track of the time on this, um, to the district was really nice. Um, it really, uh, you know, it was a better part of the day. And it probably could have been three days long, and every part of it was a little bit hurried. Um, but uh, that was pretty special. Um, and uh, across the board, just everybody's, the energy was good, the, um, the hopefulness was good, the spirit of like here and now and moving forward was really there. Um, the, I know there's been some uh, struggles in the district, and nobody was interested in talking about them or thinking about the past. It was all just kind of like uh, moving forward, which is a really nice thing. Um, I met, uh, I did run into some parents as well, which was nice, even though that wasn't a formal part of the day. Um, and I, ca I came into this, uh, I think it's a healthy thing. I, I didn't come into this as the school board chair knows. I didn't say, I want to be your next superintendent. I came into this saying, well, I, let's, let's talk about this because maybe this is a good thing. And uh, um, and you have to decide what makes sense for your uh, school district. Um, and I think I've already decided, like, whoa, I, I would love to do this. And it led me to have a lot of conversations with folks that know more about central office work than I do. And uh, it was all very inspiring. And uh, yeah, I just uh, I told the story to the school board. I just asked about Summersworth. I, when I started at the high school, it was just this random thing. You know, Eric's in the gym by himself, painting the Hilltopper cat above the bleachers, um, the baseball field, not just, you know, that it's an awesome baseball field, but the dedication and time and energy that went into that baseball field when I finally saw it, um, hustling to uh, run across the river to go watch my daughter play soccer and stopping at uh, Summersworth House of Pizza to get a Slice not heated, no plate, don't need a box, just hand it to me. I'm going to run out the door and drive over there with it. And the owner telling me, no, <laughs> I'm warming it up and you're sitting down. <laughs> and uh, I listened to him and he ended up sitting with me. Um, and, uh, you know, th that kind of had that experience a lot. Uh, I met Emmett at the teetotaler uh, shortly coming in and then Mamadou shortly after that. There's just a, there's so many good stories and so many families and so much dedication um, to this community. And, and struggles like every other community um, with drug and alcohol and discipline and disengagement, that's, that's everywhere. Um, and uh, I just find it pretty exciting that there's a lot of potential here and a lot of energy around it and to, to contribute. I think the schools are, in my opinion, separate from, are just going to be absolutely central to kind of where Summersworth is 10 or 20 years from now. Um, I know Eric agreed with that uh, sentiment when we talked in the earlier. Um, and if I can be a small part of helping to get that right, um, that might be pretty exciting. On behalf of the city of Summersworth, I say to you, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. But it, I don't know if we, we got either questions or I'll just stick around. What makes the most sense? I think we'll end the television part, okay. and you're welcome to stick around, anyone who would like to ask him questions. And I, anybody, for folks watching at home, I appreciate everybody's here. I regret that uh, the, the format is that it is, that you're getting it very one way. Um, Thank you, Eric, for all you do. Um, so I'm not going, you can, if you need to go somewhere, just get up and go. Um, but I'm happy to stick around.